Well, I'm starting a brand new series. We'll be in this for about 13 weeks, a survey of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, I understand that there's some good Sunday school lessons this morning on the Beatitudes, and that's where we'll be this morning. And so if I mess up any at all, revert back to your Sunday school lesson and what they told you, and you'll be right back on track. So the Sermon on the Mount series, Picture of a Christian, is what I've entitled this. This whole Sermon on the Mount is really the picture or the portrait of a Christian. This is not for unbelievers. This Sermon on the Mount is describing what children of the kingdom look like. And so if you are a child of the king, you're going to see these things in your life and growing and developing around you. If you're not a Christian, you won't see these things in your life. But you know what? Today's the day you could say, Lord, I want to entrust my life to you and to be saved. So we're going to look through some of this. Uh, the key for me, the whole thing that Jesus is getting at here is from Matthew 6, 8, do not be like them. All through the Old Testament, God is saying, come out, be separate, come away from the world. Don't try to be like the world. Don't try to be like the pop culture around you. Come out, be separate from. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's even saying to religious people, don't be like them. And don't be like the Pharisees who have this act. They play like they're good and holy and Christian, but they are hypocrites. Do not be like them. So don't be like the world. And don't be like those in the church who are acting like Christians but are not really Christians out in the world. They may come into this place and say they're Christian, but if they're not really walking like a, a Christian, the Bible says do not be like them. That's hypocrisy, and that's dangerous. Be careful. That can come into any of our lives. John Stott, a theologian and a preacher, said this, probably the greatest tragedy of the church throughout its long and checkered history has been its constant tendency to conform to the prevailing culture instead of developing a Christian counterculture. There are some churches that try to be so much like the world to get the world that they lose their influence. Now, I understand their method is, their, 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 their idea is good. They want to reach the world, but we've got to be careful. We want to reach the world, but how do we reach the world? We reach the world by being different from the world. We have something different the world doesn't have, and so we present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I've got to cuss, and I've got to drink, and I've got to do all these things, and I've got to go out and be like the world to win the world. No, the Bible doesn't talk about that. The Bible says that we are to be separate. We're to come out from the world, and it's our difference that is appetizing to the world. When they see you on the job, and you're honest, and you're fair, and you do the right thing, they're like, why do you do that? You could get ahead. You could cut corners. No one would ever know. You say, no, I live by a different kingdom. I live in the kingdom of God. People take note of that kind of living. Live for God. <laughs> All the people are going to the left. That's, that's the culture. That, this way to culture. But as Christians, we face the other way. We're swimming upstream. We're saying, no, we go a different way. And children of the king, we're going to see in Sermon on the Mount, as we go a different way. This is from the message. This is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I want to give you the end on the first Sunday. After Jesus gives this great sermon, which really wasn't on a mountain, it was more like a hill, here's what the people said. When Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying, quite a contrast to the religious teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. So at the end of my sermon... I just want you to break out, no, I'm kidding, into applause, no. I want you to hear the words of Jesus today, and because you are Christian, your life will be motivated today. Because you are a Christian, you'll be encouraged today. Think, I'm on the right track. I'm going in the right direction. And so be edified today, church, be edified. So again, focusing on Jesus. Okay, here we go. We're going to focus on Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is giving this to who? It's to the inner crowd, really. It's the disciples we're going to see in just a moment. But the focus is on living this life for Jesus. Now let's look at Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Jesus has just come out of being tempted. He's been healing. He's been around the crowd, demon-possessed people. And now it says here in verse 1, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God add blessing to the reading and doing of his holy word today. We're going to jump right in here. This, this is a crazy way to start this chapter, but Matthew does it. He just kind of narrates what happened here. When Jesus saw the crowds, there could have been thousands of people around him. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Now, that's the Hebrew way to teach. That's the Jewish way to teach. We are more of a Greco-Roman teaching society, and so the teacher stands. That's why I stand in front of you. We're from a Greco-Roman style. Maybe one of these years we'll try it the other way. And you guys can stand while I sit and teach you. That's how, that's how Jesus did it. Jesus sat as they stood around him to listen. So Jesus sat down. His disciples came to him. This isn't the crowd. This is the, this is the disciples, the 12 and some others that are there. Those who want to climb that mountain with him, they get close to Jesus, and they're willing to leave the crowd to go and hear what Jesus is saying. Jesus sits down, and he began to teach them. We're, we're hearing the very teaching of Jesus here this morning. It's, it's impressive. He starts off blessed. This, this is idea of happy, fortunate. Now, it's not, I got a raise, I got a new car, I got a, I got a new wife, I got a new... It's not that. We're talking about, this is not happenstance. We're talking about the blessing of God on your life, that you are fortunate, that you are more than just happy. It's not happenstance. It's because you know that God lives in your life. Tomorrow can be really, really cold, and I think it's going to be. That doesn't affect your spiritual state. It can affect your mood. It can affect all of our moods, right? But it doesn't affect your spiritual state. You are still blessed tomorrow morning if it's really cold. You're really blessed. If you wake up, you don't have a job, you're still blessed. If you wake up and things aren't going your way, you're still blessed. Amen? You're blessed. You're happy. You're fortunate. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus getting at? You have to be poor? You have to throw all your money out and live on the street and be a vagabond? No, he's not saying poor. He's saying poor in spirit. What does that mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, and the Greek says, and theirs only is the kingdom of heaven. What's he getting at? You ever heard this hymn before? Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Whew. That's poverty of spirit. Recognizing you have nothing to bring to God. You are in trouble. All of us deserve hell. All of us deserve eternal torment. And we recognize that we have nothing good to bring to God. We come and we stand like paupers, spiritual paupers, and we say, oh God, I have nothing in my hand to bring simply to thy cross I cling. The only thing, Lord, I can do is just say, save me. That's the first beatitude. It's important. That's the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, recognizing your need and reaching out to God for help. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Revelation 3.16, Jesus said, so because you are lukewarm, Neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. It's, there's no pride in the kingdom of God. It's not like you got in on your own or I got in on my own. None of us are getting in on our own. We only get in because of the grace of Jesus Christ. So we come poor in spirit like paupers. And what does that lead to? It leads to the next one. When you realize how bad you are, how bad we are, how much in need we are, we mourn. Oh, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This isn't just crying. You, you mean you, you cry, you get into heaven? You cry, you get comforted? 
It's, it's something more. Again, it's not just tears. It's what's going on in your heart. Lloyd-Jones said this, As I confront God and His holiness and contemplate the life I am meant to live, I see myself, my utter helplessness and hopelessness. This morning leads to repentance and conversion. When you see your need, if you could really see what it's like out there in eternity if you don't have Christ, if you could really see that and you could see that's what you deserve, you'd cry too, like, oh, that's where I'm going to go? Oh, God, help me. And you're, oh, I'm poor in spirit. Oh, God, I mourn over my sin. I mourn over my state. Oh, God, help me. God comforts that person, not the cocky, not the proud, not the arrogant. Mourning over wrong in the world. It's mourning over personal loss. It's mourning over one's own sinfulness. Mourning over the death of someone close. Even a neighbor who hurts himself. I read of a story of a man, an older man, taking a shower, and he slipped and he fell through the glass doors of the shower, and one of the pieces of glass cut into his body and near his heart. His wife ran in, heard him scream, and she turned off the water, and she got a robe around him, called 911. Ambulance comes, the fire department comes, the police come, all the dogs are howling, and they get him to the hospital, and he is well. They bring him back home. And the lady said that not one neighbor ever came over. All the sirens, all the noise, all the affair, not one neighbor in that crowded neighborhood came over to see what was going on or what was even the matter. And I think that we should be people that we say, you know what, we, we mourn over the things around us. We get involved in people's lives around us and we mourn with them about things in their life. Mourn with those who mourn. Leads to be blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. What does it mean to be meek? Have you thought about that? If you had to define meekness to a fifth grader, what would you say? Blessed are the meek. Richard Trench said this, meekness is that temper of spirit in which we accept God's dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing or resisting. Think about Christ. He went to the cross. He never complained. He never said, oh, wah, wah, God, why me? He was humble. He was meek. Jesus went to the cross knowing that God's dealings with him were good. Therefore, he did it without disputing or resisting. Has your family heard you complain in the last month? We have no right to complain. We say, God, very meekly, I accept your lot in life for me. This job I have, this life I have, what's going on in my life, Lord, I, I, I say, I trust you. And meekness is saying, God, I am humble and gentle before you. We're going to see how this plays out here in just a second. Look at this. Meek means power under control. That horse could raise his head up right there, and that girl would be off the ground in no time. <laughs> that horse is not weak. That horse is meek. When you're meek, it's power under control. I, when I was doing children's ministries, I used to ask the kids this question. Which is more powerful, a wild stallion or a tame stallion? And they'd say, the wild stallion is more powerful. I said, nope, they're both the same in strength. Just one is more useful. One is under God's use, so to speak. And I said, you need to be under God's use. So power under control. Are you meek? Would your family describe you as gentle? See, Pastor, why do you keep talking about our families like this? This is making me feel a little uncomfortable. It's because our families know us best, don't they? Your kids know you best. Your grandkids know you best. Would your family describe you as meek, as gentle, humble in heart? The only place I can find in all of the scriptures where Jesus describes himself is right here in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What are we to learn? He said, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We're never more like Jesus than when we're gentle and humble. Not cocky, arrogant, conceited. We used to call it when I was a kid, stuck up, nose in the air, when it rained, you're going to drown, right? That's, what, that's conceited. No, humble. Now, it doesn't mean you're a doormat, but it means it's power under control. I got to tell one story. I've said it before. I want to say it again. I, I remember being in a board meeting when I was a youth pastor in Carthage, Missouri. I was 30 years old, I think. Had this board meeting, and this one board member just had a, something, he had a burr under his saddle. That just means he just was uncomfortable. 
And he was there, and he just, he went off on a tyrant. Well, we have all this money coming to the church. How much do we give to others? How much do we give to others? How much do we give to others? Blah, blah, blah. Do we do anything for missions? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was just, I thought, what in the world? We had a demon in the board meeting for a second, I felt like. And I, being a good staff member, knew I didn't have to answer. I looked at Pastor Tompkins. And Pastor Tompkins' face was just a little bit red, probably hit all this heat. And when this guy was done with that tirade, Pastor said, well, you know what? Let me, uh, let me get that number for you, Richard, and I'll come back and get that number to you. Thing was done. I was like, whew, that was smart. Good job. <laughs> they kept the board meeting going, and uh, the next month, I'd forgotten all about it. First thing after prayer, I remember Pastor Hopkins had a little sheet of paper. Pull out, oh, hey, Richard, I got some numbers for you. We give this, 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 this to missions, this to help others, this. He had all these numbers. He just stopped the whole thing. All that arguing, complaining, disputing, he just solved it by just very calmly giving what we gave to others. And I want to tell you, this church gives at least 17% of every dollar that you give away. Did you know that? It goes out of here. Just want you to know, keep giving. Thank you for your faithfulness to the God. To God, we give money away. We help other people, so thank you for faithfulness. Pastor Tompkins was a good illustration for me of power under control. He could have stood up. He could have flipped that table and said, we're out of here. Yeah, <laughs> that had been bad. <laughs> but he had power under control. He was the chairman of the board. He had complete control of that board meeting by letting that thing just pass by and handling it the right way. Does your family look at you and say you're gentle? <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the next one. What in the world? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness. You crave justice. You crave goodness. You crave being right with God. Blessed are those who, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, I don't want to call anybody in here a cow. <laughs> but, but here's what I get at. If you have cattle, you know this, that when cows are eating and moving around, they're not satisfied. They keep they keep grazing. They keep moving around. They keep looking for more food. And when they get their fill, cows will lay down and cows will chew their cud through the four stomachs. They'll regurg sorry, regurgitate, chew on it, send it down, bring it back four times. And a farmer, a good farmer knows that his cattle are contented when they're laying down. That's a good sign to see a cow that's laying down. It's a good sign when you are contented in Christ. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, then you'll be content. You'll be satisfied, satiated. You go after these other things in the world and they never satisfy. Have you noticed that? More money, more fame, more prestige, bigger job, bigger car, bigger house, bigger wife, bigger life, whatever it is, right? At least some of those. What I'm getting at is when you seek after God, then you are satisfied. Are you guys picking up what I'm laying down? <laughs> you can't find satisfaction outside of Christ. When you, when you feast on the Word of God, when you feast on His Holy Spirit, then and only then are you satisfied. They will be filled. You'll be filled with the good things of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That guy could crush that bird. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What is mercy? It's different than grace. Grace is getting something good you don't deserve. But mercy is different. It's the opposite side of that same coin. Mercy is not getting something bad that you do deserve. So grace is getting heaven. It's something good. We don't deserve it. Mercy is not getting hell, which is what we deserve. So we need both. I like grace and I like mercy. I want to go to heaven, and I don't want to go to hell. Grace is that we get heaven. Mercy is that we don't get hell. And here the Bible says, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. People who are full of mercy. That means when you're wrong, when you're, when you're turned upside down, when somebody abuses you and you extend to them mercy, and they deserve the book to be thrown at them, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, this can be in civil stuff. This can be in marriages. This can be parents and, parents and, and children. When you have them dead to rights, and you say, you know what, I'm going to extend mercy. That's what he's talking about. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Mercy is kindness in action. It's the good Samaritan. Remember the, the man, he's, he's robbed, he's laying on the side of the road half dead and, and, and a good priest comes by, an Israelite, and he sees this man, he, oh, and he passes by the other side. And then along comes a Levite, a helper in the temple, somebody who knows what he ought to do, and he passes on by and he doesn't help his brother in need. He goes on. And then a Samaritan, a half-breed is what they'd be called, half-Jewish, half-something else, impure race they'd be called, a Samaritan comes by and he has compassion. This is kindness in action. What does he do? He picks him up and he puts him on his donkey, takes him in and he takes him to the hospital and, and he, he gets him all fixed up and he says, hey, let him stay here in the inn and if, if there's any extra need, I'll come back by and I'll pay the extra, extra part of the bill. And Jesus says, which one showed compassion and mercy? <sighs> Pastor, who are we supposed to show compassion and mercy to? Your neighbor. Somebody in need around you. Would your family describe you as merciful? Would they describe you as full of mercy? Think on that. Mercy means getting into the other person's skin. It means feeling what they feel. It's empathy, really. It's, it's saying, I, I feel what you feel. I, I, I hurt for you. And, it, and mercy gets involved. Mercy can't turn a blind eye. Mercy must get its hands dirty. Mercy dives in. Well, how much is it going to cost? And how much time will it take? And will, will I be able to? Mercy says, I'm willing to take a stab at it right now. <sighs> I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself right here for you. I came up here to the church yesterday doing some things, and then I was going home, and I saw a guy. His truck was pulled in this, this little daycare over here halfway in. His car was dead. And I'm like, he had his hood up. And I thought, boy, I hope he gets some help. And I drove on by. I drove on by. And, and I was like, the Lord started saying, what are you preaching on tomorrow? No. Oh, I failed. I went down there and did a U-turn, came back, pulled in front of this guy. He had jumper cables. He, he, looked, he worked for McClarty. And uh, he was one of the mechanics, and he was out there, and he said, I, my battery's dead, and the alternator, something's wrong. And so he said, can you give me a jump? So I said, sure. He had his jumper cables already on the car, waiting for somebody to come and help him. And I just pull up there and hook him up, get the car jumped, starts up. He says, thank you. I said, God bless you. And I, he, he'd been cussing a little bit about his car being all messed up. And, he, and I said, well, God bless you. Have a great day. And, I, and as I'm leaving, I'm driving off, and I see his car pull up a little bit, and it stops again. I was like, uh-oh. And I kept on driving. <laughs> That's like, what am I preaching on tomorrow? <laughs> Turned around, went back again, pulled up there in the same parking lot. And I, I said, what happened? He said, I, I think my battery's gone. It's not going to work. He said, my boss is coming. He said, he's going to help here in, in a minute. And so I said, well, maybe I can help you. And he, his boss comes up and let's push his car up here and get it out of the street anyway. So we're, there are three of us trying to push this car up. And it's kind of an incline there. And I didn't realize how much of an incline or how weak I had become. This Daniel fast is getting to me. No. And so anyway, we're trying to push this car up, and we, we get it halfway up, and it stops, and it starts rolling back. And his boss is yelling, brake, brake, brake. We're behind there. He's sliding back, and he finally puts the brake on. And then another guy pulls up. Oh, he looked like a muscle man, like a Dwayne Smith. You know, and he, he pulls up. And so he comes in. He goes, you need some help? I said, sure, come on. So we all get it. We push it up over to the side and park it, and his boss takes him to work. He said, we'll get this later. I failed that test initially. I'm just telling you, it's, it's so easy, isn't it, to just pass on by. It's so easy to turn a blind eye and say, well, I hope somebody helps. Well, what if that were you? What would you want somebody to do? You'd want somebody to help you, wouldn't you? So do better than me. Stop on the first time and, and give some help, would you? If you see somebody in need, help them. Not just a car. I mean, you got to be careful, women. If it's some guy at nighttime, I'm not saying stop there. I'm saying you call help. But if you've got the means to help, just help. How much time will it take? I don't know. I went back, I was thinking, is he going to ask me for money? That's what I was asking. Is he going to ask me for money? Well, where did that thought come from? That's not very merciful, is it? But help where you can. Say, God, I want to be full of mercy to help those around me, for they will be shown mercy. Remember, this Sermon on the Mount is a picture of a Christian. This whole Sermon on the Mount is a picture of a Christian, which is Christ. Moving on through, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does that mean? Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart. How do we get our hearts pure? First of all, the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they and they only shall see God. 
Can I have a little bit of perversion? Can I have a little bit of a dirtiness in me? Can I, have a, can I have a little bit of thievery in me? Can I have a little bit of adultery? Can I have a little bit of coveting in me? And, and he's saying, no, it's, it's only those who are pure in heart that will see God. You can't two-time God. He's saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they and they only shall see God. What, what is this getting at? It means, it means undivided loyalty, free from hypocrisy. In America, we pledge our allegiance to a flag for the principles of freedom, which are great. We pledge allegiance. We have undivided loyalty. We don't become spies for some other country. We are united and we are loyal to our country. The same way in Christianity, we say we are loyal to the things of God. We will not bend on our principles. We will not falter. We will not lie. We will not steal. We will be divided. And we're also free from hypocrisy. That's what it's getting at. It's alloys that are not polluted with other things, metal alloys that are not polluted with other contaminants. It's single-minded. It's whole without hypocrisy, sincere. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they and they only shall see God. I heard the story of a pastor over in Britain. He, he would get on the bus at his house, and he would drive across town, ride across town, and he, he'd get off at the, at, the, at the church and work. Then he'd ride the bus home. One morning he got on that bus and he, he uh, gave some money and the, the driver gave him back some, some money. He went and sat down and the, the preacher's looking at the money. He thought, that guy, he undercharged me by quite a bit. Wow, thank you, Lord, for this free gift today. And as he sat there, the Lord began to work on him and that preacher thought, I can't do this. And so when he got off, he returned the change. He said, sir, you made a mistake. You gave me too much money back. And the driver said, it was no mistake. I was in your church yesterday when you talked about honesty, preacher, and I was just testing you to see if you'd be honest. <laughs> Pure in heart, without hypocrisy. Lord, help us, right? Lord, help me. Lord, help us to be people of purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. Here's another one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. <laughs> We're holding back two parties that are wanting to kill each other. The peacemakers, not peacekeepers, the peacemakers are able to bring peace in that situation between two heated parties. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, here, here, I found this quote. There is a difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Peacekeepers don't care anything about resolving anything. They just want the noise to stop. In order to be a peacemaker, you actually have to confront the issue, deal with it, and try to broker peace in the midst of it. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. That's tough work. It's taking two different parties that are at odds and trying to make them one. That's not easy. Peacekeepers, it's yellow-bellied. It's easy. It's the easy way out. It's just trying to stop the fight. But peacemaking is resolving the fight. Peacemaking is going in and doing the hard work of dealing with the issues at hand. Big difference. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a peacemaker? Would your, defam your family define you as a peacemaker? Paul said, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now remember, Jesus went to the cross he was the Prince of Peace, and people hated him. So that's why the scripture says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Jesus couldn't make everyone love him, but Jesus did his part to do everything he could, right? And your job is to live in a peaceful way, to do everything you can to live at peace with everybody. Somebody mad at you? Well, have you gone back and apologized? You go, yes, I have. Did they receive it? No, they didn't. They're still mad at me. You're okay. You've done all you were supposed to do. You said you were sorry. Now it's on them, right? So you can't have guilt for that. That's not your fault. That's not your problem anymore. You live at peace with everybody as much as it is possible, right? Live at peace with those around you. Jesus says this to us as well. Another scripture for Paul says in Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort. It takes some strength. It takes some skill. It takes some power. It takes some energy. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Would your family describe you as a keeper of the peace, as a maker of the peace? 
Last one, Matthew 5.10, persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted. That enemy, maybe Satan, you have to see that picture that he's piercing through Christ in the white. You may not be able to see that completely. Through Christ's heart into the heart of a believer. The persecution started with Christ. And all those who follow Christ will be persecuted. Your heart will be pierced by the enemy. Blessed are the persecuted. When you're persecuted for Christ's sake, you are blessed. When you're made fun of at work for being a Christian, when you bow your head to pray before a meal out in the workplace and somebody laughs at you, that's simple persecution. When it gets deeper, I don't know how we'll respond, church. When our jobs are shut down, whenever we can't come to church anymore, I've said it before, can you imagine if, if you knew you came to church, somebody's going to shoot you if you came in these doors, would you still come? Well, no, I think I'd start a church underground. Well, what I'm getting at is there will be persecution at some point for us. We have no doubt about that. I don't know when that'll happen, but what will we do? Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness. He goes on, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. This is the mark of a Christian. I'm going to give you a story here to close. You've heard of Charles Spurgeon, great preacher. He had a church that was filling up so fast. He was salt. He was light. He'd bring hard messages, and he started having people come against him. He had people in the church saying, you're preaching too strong. We don't want this kind of preaching. You're, we don't like this fire and brimstone in the church. We don't like this hot stuff. Tame it down a little bit. Pipe down a little bit. And Charles Spurgeon was hearing this, and then people were writing ads in the paper against him for being too hot of a preacher. And they were working against him. People were starting rumors in the church about him. And he said that he began to listen to that stuff. Charles Spurgeon began to listen to those rumors, the rumor mongering. He began to read stuff in the paper about him. And he thought, that's not true. I'm just doing what you've asked me to do, God. He started to get down. He started to wilt under that pressure, this man of God. And his wife, Susanna, saw that he was wilting under this pressure. And so what she did, she took a large sheet of paper and she wrote, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wrote it real big on a piece of paper, and she got on a ladder and she tacked that paper on her bedroom ceiling above where Charles Spurgeon would lay down on his bed, right up on the ceiling. So she'd go in, she'd turn the lamp on in their room, and he'd go lay down, he'd look up at that, and he'd see that on the ceiling. <laughs> He said, begin to meditate on that. His wife was praying for him. His wife was talking to him and encouraging him, a good wife, encouraging her husband to stay at the right stuff. And after about a month of that, he took that paper down. He said, the Lord's helping me. I'm good. He'd go back in that pulpit and he'd preach the message of God that was put on his heart. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs and theirs only is the kingdom of heaven. Would your family say that you do well when you're persecuted? For your faith, I pray they do. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is a picture of a Christian. Here's the question. Are we looking more like Jesus? January 2nd, 2022. We have this day. We don't know what tomorrow holds, do we? We had a lot of people buried last year. We don't know what 22 holds, but we do know this. We will walk and talk and think and act like Christians, won't we? We're going to follow the Sermon on the Mount all the way through, and we're going to say, Lord, we want this survey of the Sermon on the Mount to be a picture of our lives. I love you, and I pray, I pray that we will be authentically Christian in our walk. We won't just talk the talk, but we'll walk the walk. There's a lot of room for improvement in my life, and I, there may be for you as well. So would you commit with me that this year, at least in these 13 sermons, we're going to say, oh, Lord, help me to walk what it means to be a Christian. Would you say that with me? Say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. I want to walk as a Christian. Let's stand together for a closing prayer.